All right, hello and welcome back to lecture number 88. This is historical topic 8.14, Society in Transition. We have two themes today, politics and power and American and regional culture. We are getting close to the end here, close to the end of period eight, and so therefore close to the end of this of course, we have, I think, just about nine more lectures left. So let's get on with this one and see what we can learn. First learning objective is explain the causes and effects of continuing policy debates about the role of the federal government over time. All right, so we're going to see some conservative challenges here in the 1960s. In the 1960s, conservatives challenged liberal laws and court decisions and perceived moral and cultural decline, seeking to limit the role of the federal government and enact more assertive foreign policies. So for liberal laws and the role of government, we see a backlash against the Great Society programs and uh, the rise of the welfare state. Conservatives did not like that. One of the people who voiced that the best for the conservative movement was Barry Goldwater in the 1964 election. Even though he lost that election badly, he influenced the future conservative movement uh, that was going to take over in the 1980s. Uh, conservatives didn't like the environmental regulations, which inhibited business activity, and there was a rise of think tanks or these um, research groups based in Washington, D.C. that would lobby Congress for more business-friendly legislation. They also don't like liberal court decisions. The Warren Court in 1953 to 1969 uh, put out a lot of decisions that were protecting individual liberties at the expense of um, property rights and also they were uh, not the most popular based on the people that they were protecting. So in Mapp versus Ohio, the um, police are found to have used a piece of evidence in a court case that was um, found without a proper warrant, and so therefore the Supreme Court creates the exclusionary rule that says that you cannot use evidence against someone in court unless you had a proper warrant to gain that evidence. In Gideon versus Wainwright, a conviction is thrown out because the defendant had not been given access to an attorney uh, during the questioning uh, between him and the police. Uh, and had not been given a, an attorney during the actual trial. With Miranda versus Arizona, very similar. The, uh, Ernesto Miranda, who was uh, guilty of kidnapping and raping a young girl, uh, what her uh, charges were initially dropped because the police officers did not inform him of the, his rights to an attorney and to remain silent um, before he gave a confession. And so he ended up being let free on those charges, but he was retried for separate charges um, and without using that uh, piece of evidence or that uh, confession. That he had given. With Engel versus Vital, it makes uh, school led prayer in school unconstitutional. And with Griswold versus Connecticut, it um, allows women or married couples to access birth control uh, without having any sort of government interference. And Griswold versus Connecticut is going to pave the way uh, for a bigger court case in abortion rights with Roe versus Wade. All right, so for the perceived moral and cultural decline, we had race riots in the 1960s. Um, in 1968, we had race riots over the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. You see in the top there, it's a picture from the DC riots. There was an entire building that was destroyed and burnt down. We see the rise of feminism with the uh, publishing of the feminine mystique and the backlash that came from that uh, with Phyllis Shafley. We also saw uh, Nixon try to take hold and take advantage of this backlash. Uh, the people didn't want racial equality in the South, so he goes out to the South in the 1968 election and gives them a wink and a nod and tells them that he's going to be the candidate that's going to uh, bring law and order and that he's going to uphold the status quo. Uh, for more sort of foreign policy in the 1960s, conservatives were actually criticizing LBJ for being weak in Vietnam. 
Obviously, that's going to turn out differently because after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, LBJ is going to increase the U.S. presence in Vietnam to up to 500,000 U.S. soldiers. All right, so trusting governments, public confidence and trusting governments' ability to solve social and economic problems declined in the 1970s in the wake of economic challenges, political scandals, and foreign policy crises. So for economic challenges, we have a brand new one that we hadn't seen before. It's stagflation. That is when the economy stops growing, unemployment goes up, and inflation also goes up. In order to fix inflation or unemployment, you are going to make the other problem worse. So if you try to fix inflation, unemployment will get worse. If unemployment, if you try to fix unemployment, then inflation will get worse. And the conservative presidents in the 1970s are focusing on inflation, and so therefore unemployment's going to worsen. We have the political scandal of Watergate when Nixon is found to be complicit in the Watergate break-ins at the National Democratic Convention headquarters inside of the Watergate Hotel. He is found to have a conversation inside of the Oval Office with his closest aides, his chief of staff, and um, trying to throw off the scent from, of the FBI to the people who they had sent to record some of the conversations inside of the opposition's political party. Because of this, uh, the Congress writes up articles of impeachment in the House of Representatives, and before the articles go up to a vote for the entire House, Richard Nixon decides to resign. And then for foreign policy crisis, we see the Iran hostage crisis as the, the worst one that could not be solved by the federal government, and it ends Carter's term as president. He is not re-elected in, in the 1980 election because of it. So now we're starting to get into a period in which people are starting to lose the trust in government's ability to fix problems. This is different than what we have seen from the 1940s all the way to the 1960s. With the New Deal program and the Great Society program, people thought that because of the size and power of the federal government, that would be the institution that could take on these larger problems like the Great Depression, like poverty. But in the 1970s, people begin to be disillusioned with the uh, way that the federal government has handled these problems. All right, so the 1970s saw growing clashes between conservatives and liberals over social and cultural issues. The power of the federal government's race and movements for greater individual rights. So notice that we're still fighting about some of the same things in the 1970s as we were in the 1960s. For cultural issues, the war is still going on. Feminism is still a uh, contested issue, and gay rights are, are still an issue because the new cultural norms that are trying to be established by the feminist movement and the gay rights movement are being resisted by uh, conservatives in America. For race and power in, of the federal government, there are anti-busing campaigns to try and slow down the integration or desegregation of some schools. There's a debate on affirmative action after the UC versus Regents versus Bach case, in which the Supreme Court rules that there cannot be a quota for minority applicants in the university um, admission systems, but it does not mean that they cannot discount race as uh, something that could be considered in the admission of a student. So it paves the way for some sort of affirmative action to go forward in the United States. It will be shaped uh, a lot more in future court decisions, especially the ones in the early 2000s. And then for individual rights, um, Warren Berger, who was a conservative Supreme Court justice appointed as chief justice by Richard Nixon, actually uh, puts out one of the most liberal Supreme Court decisions in the history of the United States with Roe versus Wade. It was in his court where uh, the Supreme Court said that the banning of abortions inside of a state would be unconstitutional, that women would have access to abortions in their particular state. And there's going to be a big backlash from the conservative movement and from the religious conservative movement against the Roe versus Wade decision. But there's going to be a uh, slight 
conservative majority in the Supreme Court for many years to come. After Warren Burger retires, then uh, William Rehnquist is going to be put in place as the Supreme Court Chief Justice, and he had originally been nominated by um, Richard Nixon. And then after Rehnquist dies in the early 2000s, President George W. Bush is going to put in place another conservative, John Roberts. So there's been about a 40-year uh, streak in the Supreme Court with a conservative Supreme Court Chief Justice. All right, we have one more learning objective, that is explain the effects of the growth of religious movements over the course of the 20th century. And the key concept is the rapid and substantial growth of evangelical Christian churches and organizations was accompanied by greater political and social activism on the part of religious conservatives. So we see a growth of evangelical churches and televangelists. These are preachers who broadcast their sermons on television or on radio. We saw a version of this early in the 1940s and 1930s with Father Coughlin, but nothing to the level that it has taken, it has been taken to in the 1970s and then later on in the 1980s. Pat Robertson, Oral Roberts, uh, and Jerry Falwell, they're getting audiences of 60 to 100 million people every week. Now you can also compare this to previous religious revivals. Uh, you can go all the way back to the Second Great Awakening and the original Great Awakening and how uh, religious revivals are going to shape culture. This also expands into university education. Oral Roberts gets uh, or founds a university called Oral Roberts University and Jerry Falwell founds Liberty University in 1971. Uh, the activism of religious conservatives is something that we hadn't really seen up until this point or to this level again. So Jerry Falwell creates this group called the Moral Majority, and it's raising money and lobbying and campaigning to defeat liberal legislators in Congress. They really pick up the speed after the Roe versus Wade uh, decision in 1973. And we're also going to see a uh, sort of alliance between Protestants and Catholics for the first time after the Roe versus Wade decision, because they both agree that uh, abortion should not be legal in the United States. And that is it. Here's our recap. Through the 60s and 70s, conservatives begin to mobilize against liberal policies of the previous decades. We have a growing distrust in government after economic downturns, scandals, and foreign policy crises. And finally, a religious conservative movement began to mobilize in response to liberal policies of the 1960s. All right, thank you again for watching. We have one more lecture in period eight, and then we are going to be moving on to the last unit of the course. Please keep studying. Please keep coming back, and I'll see you on the next one.